Um, well, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is April 18th, 2022. It's 11.01, and I call this meeting to order. So um, just a few brief remarks. Uh, a reminder from last week, um, you know, talking to fire safety is a requirement uh, for all licensees. Um, this is not meant to be overly burdensome, and in fact, Fire safety doesn't have jurisdiction over every license type. Um, fire safety has jurisdiction over public buildings, and there is a definition of a public building in statute. Um, and a reminder that the CCB cannot waive um, fire safety's jurisdiction. Um, and so we require, we're going to request um, some indication that you have spoken to fire safety, uh, regardless of what license type you're seeking. Um, you know, they, uh, fire safety is prepared for these conversations. Um, you know, they can do a very quick check remotely to see if your building um, is under their jurisdiction. And so um, they've divided up the state between North and South and have assigned two people uh, to do these checks. Um, and if they do have jurisdiction to kind of schedule follow up. Um, Landon Wheeler handles the Southern part of the state. Um, his Email address is landon.wheeler at vermont.gov. His phone number is 802-216-0501. Uh, ben Moffitt handles the northern parts of the state. Um, his email is benjamin.moffitt, M-O-F-F-A-T-T, at vermont.gov. And his phone number is 802-479-479. 7581. And um, again, they can do a very quick check. Um, they'll send you a form letter if you're not subject to their jurisdiction. And even if you are subject to their jurisdiction, um, their process is not so onerous that uh, you can't get through it relatively quickly. Um, for tax compliance, um, again, um, the board is going to require a um, certificate of good standing. Um, from the tax department. Um, you know, this is spelled out in our rules, but uh, in order to get one of these, you can do this remotely as well. You don't have to go to the tax department, um, but you can email um, tax.compliance support at vermont.gov. And, um, you know, they just gave us a few tips. Uh, the subject line uh, for that email should uh, indicate it's a good standing request for a cannabis license. And um, within the email, you should include the name of your business and um, either your social security number or federal um, employee identification number. Um, let's see, the tax department is working on a comprehensive guidance document specific to cannabis businesses, um, they that should be up on their website. They have some good information on their website currently, but that kind of specific to cannabis businesses guidance document should be up on their website this week. I know uh, the draft is done. I just um, They're just polishing it off right now. That will have a very kind of detailed step-by-step -step, um, instructions on how to not just get this good standing check, which is very straightforward, but also how to um, register with them um, for kind of sales and use tax compliance and excise tax compliance. Update on pre-qualification. Um, just before I do that, a reminder, pre-qualification is not a prerequisite for an operating license. It's a voluntary process. It's um, primarily aimed at clearing people that might have a criminal conviction in their past uh, that might prevent them from ultimately getting a license. Um, there's some secondary benefits uh, for folks that are seeking a bank account or an insurance uh, bond, uh, insurance um, account or trying to talk to um, certain government agencies. Um, but it might not be right for you. Um, you know, it does include a $500 non-refundable credit towards your application. Um, it's a fee that you have to pay, but it will get credited um, towards your future license. Um, so everyone should decide whether pre-qualification is right for them. Um, 
but the numbers from this week, updated numbers as of this morning, um, there have been 643 uh, total applications submitted. Of those, though, I should note, note that 371 are incomplete in some form or another. Either the um, required documents have not been uploaded or the fee has not been paid. Um, so we are going to continue to review those today and approve some today. Um, but uh, I just want to give you an update on that. Um, and again, our first licensing window is open. It was open on April 1st. Um, as of this morning, we have 56 licenses um, that have been fully submitted. And again, we have not um, reviewed those for completeness, but they have been fully submitted. Um, and if you have any questions about prequalification or your license, um, feel free to give us um, a call. Um, we have a lot of good information on our website, which we would hope that you take a look at first if you have questions. But um, you can email us at ccb.info at vermont.gov or give us a call at 802-828-1010 and hit option zero um, for the adult use program. Other than that, um, just need to approve our minutes from April 11th, uh, last Monday. Is there a motion? Uh, so moved. Is there okay. a second? Um, great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Moving on to the agenda. Um, the first item is we're going to discuss um, guidance for escrow or bond amounts for the cessation of operations. I prepared just a few very kind of brief slides for that. Uh, if you want to take a look. All right, let's see what happens when I hit the play button. All right, so um, just as a reminder, um, in rule 1.4.4, um, we say that all applicants must submit a contingency and continuity plan that addresses the dispersal or disposal of inventory in, in the event of a, an abrupt closure. And then in 1.4.5, um, we require each applicant to submit documentation of a bond or escrow for cessation of operations of a cannabis establishment um, cost to be determined by a board in guidance. And a reminder that we did waive 1.4.5B, this documentation of bond or escrow, for tier one cultivators, um, but not the not the continuity plan. And essentially, I think uh, you know why we have this is um, you know this is a controlled substance. Um, it is federally illegal, um, and if a business um, has to abruptly shut um, or if their license is revoked for some reason. We need to have some assurance that um, the product, the controlled substance, is not going to end up on the illicit market. Um, a lot of states, I'd say the vast majority of them, require that anyone who's being licensed have a certain amount of assets. I think this is our kind of way around that. Um, we know that you know saying that every licensee needs to have you know a minimum of two million dollars in assets. Um, would be just an ultimate barrier for too many people. But that being said, if we do need to revoke a license or if a business fails, um, we need to have some assurance that the kind of the bill doesn't get passed on to the state um, or the cannabis board um, for ensuring proper disposal or destruction of you know this controlled substance. So Massachusetts um, has a very similar scheme um, laid out. Um, this is from their rules. Um, and again, it's just the requirement um, to have a bond 
or an escrow account uh, with a certain amount of money in it um, that can be used for those four purposes that are laid out in sub A. Um, and the amount that they require, they do also, by the way, have a minimum assets uh, requirement for um, owning a license. I think it's, they, you need to show that you have assets uh, of a minimum of half a million dollars. But um, they also have this fee uh, or this escrow amount. And they say it's either the amount of your license um, or it's uh, $5,000. And then again, it can be used for the destruction of cannabis goods. Um, it can be used for the cost of compensation for a corner pointee, cessation of operations, or whatever other use the commission may authorize or deem necessary. Is that $5,000 no matter size type of license? It, they oh. strongly suggest that it's the, and I, I have the wording in the guidance, I think, but they strongly suggest uh, the amount of your license, but they're willing to consider 5,000 in the, the alternative. Okay. So this is from their guidance on this section. Um, you can see that it's really um, set aside for either um, winding down or dismantling a marijuana establishment or a dispensary. Um, it can be used for satisfy satisfying outstanding sales tax obligations, um, securing a licensee's facility in the, in the event that they have to abruptly shut down um, and the costs for destroying uh, marijuana or marijuana products in the inventory. Um, and then so it applies, um, you know, the kind of fee amount is what they suggest, the licensing fee amount, even if your license fee has been waived, just look at the underlying uh, fee amount for your, for your license or at a minimum of $5,000. So that's what Massachusetts does. I'm not saying that we should follow them. Um, here are some things that I just, some questions that I put forward to uh, you guys, Julie and Kyle. Um, so we, as we know, as we saw last week, that we are gonna require, if you cannot get an insurance policy that you set aside a certain amount of money in escrow to cover um, claims against your company. Um, you know, one of the questions that comes to mind is if you have one of these insurance escrow accounts, do you need a separate insurance escrow account, uh, or a, a separate escrow account for, um, cessation of operations, or can we combine the two? Um, second question, how much do we want to see, um, for cessation of operations? Do we want it pegged to someone's license fee? Do we want some alternative amount like Massachusetts does that just applies universally to all licenses? Um, are we okay with just saying those amounts that we set aside, you set aside for your insurance escrow could also be used for this? So we don't need an additional amount if you're going for an insurance escrow um, or some other amount. Um, uh, another one is, should do we need this for testing facilities, um, which are largely not going to probably have a lot of um, a lot of cannabis on site? Maybe they are, um, but it seems to me that they're not cultivating. They have samples, um, and the the samples are going to be secured. But just a question about whether this should apply to testing facilities, and then. Um, tier one manufacturers. And again, those are the home-based food processors, kind of the, the smallest level of manufacturers. And then um, should our waiver, should our waiver provision, our general waiver authority come into play in determining um, how much someone might need to set aside for a wind down cost costs? So those are just a few questions. Um, that I had. Um, I talked uh, internally with David and Bryn a little bit on this, and it seems to me that if someone is going to get an escrow account for insurance, that they should not also have to get a separate escrow account for wind down costs, that we can expand the scope 
of um, that escrow account, the authority to spend that money and just include wind down costs. Um, that being said, if someone gets an insurance policy and um, they should then have to have an escrow account for wind down costs in addition. So, mm -hmm. um, so we should also, even if we decide that that amount would be sufficient, the, the amounts that we uh, designated for the insurance alternative escrow, we still need to probably think about what we want for wind down costs um, in the event that someone gets an insurance policy and needs to set up one of these accounts separately. Okay. So can so I, I jump some, in? Yeah, please. Oh, are, are you going to suggest some amounts, Pepper? I did have some suggested amounts okay. on the next slide. Okay, I'll wait. Um, but do we want to, I, I guess, do we want to talk about whether testing facilities or these kind of tier one home base provider or home base manufacturers need? I mean, should we be treating tier one manufacturers the same way we treat tier one cultivators, essentially, just recognizing that the the scope of what they're doing is minimal, the potential impact is much less, and that a wind down cost might it might not make sense to set a specific amount for for tier one manufacturers. Anyone have any thoughts on that? I think it depends on what we set aside for amounts. Like if we were to say it's like a month's operational costs or something like that, then it probably could be the same across the board because it would vary based on size of business. But if we pick a blanket amount, um, we may want to adjust for tier one. Okay. Yeah, and maybe similar questions. Maybe <clears throat> the next slide will will show. But are you we thinking yeah. blanket amount? Okay. Yeah. So, so essentially, um, I took out testing labs, but we can obviously add them back in. Um, I think that I think yeah. personally that makes sense. Yeah. I'm fine with that. So these are the categories that we um, used for our bond escrow amounts for insurance alternatives. So it's retailers, wholesalers, integrated, tier three manufacturers, um, which is the ones that can use solvent-based extraction. Um, the tier four, five, and six cultivators of any type. So that would be the general $5,000 set aside uh, for cessation of operations. And then for tier one and two manufacturers, which could just be tier two manufacturers. Um, and then the tier two and three cultivators 2,500, so just half. And I don't know if that's the right amount or not. I just proposed something. Um, and that's it. I mean, essentially, um, I'm open to any suggestions on this. I can show you, if you'd like, the amounts that you have to set aside for insurance. You'd like to see that as well. We we said it was commercially reasonable insurance, and then was it ten thousand dollars, Pepper, for set aside? Um, okay. I'll pull it up. I think that's what it was. When I did this for insurance programs, for self-funded programs, we had to set aside a certain amount based on, like. Um, three months worth of claims, for example. So if the business ceased operations, there would still be enough money to pay out a certain amount of claims. So when I was thinking about this this morning, I was thinking about it very similarly, but in terms of like operational costs. I'm sensitive to um, requiring businesses to set aside too much in an escrow in early years because they're young businesses and they're gonna wanna reinvest as much money as possible in their business. Um, so I just want to, that's the, those are the things I'm thinking about. Yeah. And just so I remember, you said in Massachusetts, it was equal to your license fee and an alternative to that could be $5,000 if you show that you can't, yeah. you know, meet that. Yeah. Okay. And where you're proposing, we don't tie it to licensing fees. We just use some blanket numbers depending on your tiering size. We, we could, my numbers are generally going to be. It seems like it's pretty, it's it's lower than the. For the, the most part, it's lower, part, yeah. yeah. Is 
I mean, this is what we did for insurance. And essentially what we would do here, um, if you were going to use an escrow account as an alternative to insurance, we would expand the scope of that escrow account to include kind of costs associated with cessation of operations. So you wouldn't have to get two escrow accounts. I agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then the real question is someone gets an insurance policy. They don't have one of these insurance escrow accounts. How much do we feel is necessary for a wind down cost? And again, you know, if you remember what we did for kind of destruction of a crop, um, you know, we made it pretty broad and inex relatively inexpensive. Um, a lot of options. A lot of options. Um, so maybe for cultivators, it doesn't need to be um, overly expensive. But, you know, depending on, I mean, if you're a retailer, for instance, and you have to abruptly shut down and you, know, you have to. Those are where my concerns are a little bit. Yeah. You know. Well, I guess I mean, the I feel like question I'm... is, are, the, are these numbers too, too large? Um, are they not large enough? Are they, are they, is this the right breakdown in license types? I think I it's the, the right other... break. Oh, sorry, Kyle. No, go ahead. I think it's the right breakdown in license types i think a sum of no less than five thousand is probably all right i um i'm thinking too like if someone was really going to cease operations like for manufacturers they would have assets right so I, i'm not sure that you know 2500 is probably okay if they're also going to sell their assets so then would you move tier three down tier um, three manufacturers no, because those are designed to be home-based businesses. I don't, well, yeah, I, yes, I think I would. Yep. Well, so the tier three, just remember, the, the legislature switched them. So tier yeah. one oh. is home-based. Tier, th okay. tier two is uh, kind of just, yeah. you know, non-solvent basic strategy. I'm still getting used to that switch. Too. Yeah, yep. tier, Sorry. tier three. Is, <laughs> yeah. I mean, some of the manufacturers, depending on how they own certain pieces of equipment either they're going to cost way more than right you know what's being held in here right well i used to have a slide i took it off about what we could consider for a waiver and looking at someone's assets you know and their cessation and continuity plan at the time of licensure um could certainly play into how much someone needs to actually set aside I think I'm comfortable with this. I think one thing based off one of your slides on questions is do we want tier one to be subject to this or do we think we can waive the requirement for tier one manufacturers? Right. I don't know, Julie, if you have any thoughts on that. Treating tier ones here like we would a small cultivator. Yes. I yes, I agree with that. I would like to be able to waive it for tier one, especially if it's a pretty low asset. So this would be Oh, lost it for a second. That sunshine must be pulling her in. <laughs> I, I think that makes sense. Okay. All right. Well, then why don't we why don't we leave it like this? And um, if we find that this is unachievable for certain people, we can evaluate them on a case by case basis. And we did also decide that if somebody in instead of insurance is taking out an account and holding that in escrow, that 10 grand, they could just yes. put this money into that account instead of having to do another account That's and right. pay more fees for that account. Well, I actually think if, you, if you're establishing an escrow account for an alternative to in, an insurance policy, that th those amounts that are in 2.2.2 we just looked at would be sufficient for this oh, okay. as well. Okay. Not in addition. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I understood yeah. that. Okay. So we will update our website with this information then as guidance on um, you know, cessation costs.
Okay. Um, so next on the agenda is to vote to close the window for pre-qualification applications on May 31st. Again, um, we need to provide the industry, um, the public 30 days notice before we open or close any window, um, whether that's pre-qualification or, or licensure, general licensure. Um, and uh, really, I think the motivation behind this is it looks like we have kind of healthy numbers in all aspects of pre-qualification. If we close on May 31st, that lines us up with um, the opening of all of our license types, with the exception, I think, of retailers. And, um, you know, we as a board really need to start focusing on um, approving operating licenses. And so I think everyone has kind of a good grasp of the pre qualification. Um, And so um, I think we, sorry, um, do need to, we, it probably makes sense for us to close the pre-qualification licensing window at this point, um, or not at this point, but vote to close it on May 31st. So I'll move that the board closes our pre-qualification window on May 31st, 2022. Um, okay. okay. I just, uh, sorry. Am I moving too fast? Um, no, okay. that's all good. Any any further discussion of that point? I think that makes sense. There's a lot of people in the pre-qual window. Some are withdrawing in anticipation of full licensure. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think the direction we need to move is our staff needs to be starting to focus more on the operating licenses full time. Yeah. All right, um, Julie, anything else there? No, thank okay. you, though. Okay. Okay. Um, then all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, okay, great. Um, so we'll, again, update our website with that decision as well. Uh, next, um, just a review of staff recommendations on pre-qualification applications. Um, Bryn, are you uh, with us for this? Yep, I am. Okay, well, I'll turn things over to you then. Okay, sounds good. <clears throat> so rather than share my screen from here, I'm wondering if David might be willing to plug in and share our- I got you. <clears throat> Thank you. So um, before I start going through the pre-qualification application registry, I just want to um, give everyone a reminder that uh, we are, our staff is working to develop all of these systems for reviewing the pre-qualification applications. And also they're still working on um, consolidating the data um, that we are all going to need to track to identify where we are in the process. So um, this registry is really kind of a work in progress and we will be able to report on more information more data on where the applications are in the coming weeks um, we have we still have really limited staff um, our positions for additional licensing staff are going to be posted in the next couple of days so we are um, we're underway with bringing on our full team on board and we're going to have more capacity to collect data and report data um, soon. So just a disclaimer here that this is this is really a work in progress and it will it will contain more information as as, as time goes on. So that um, having said that we have um, a number of pre qualification applications to approve today. Um, and again, just as with every week, these are applications that staff has reviewed and determined um, to be sufficient to meet the requirements contained in rules 1.4.1 and 1.4.2. And all of these applicants um, either have no, um, have a clear record check or have no uh, presumptively disqualifying convictions on their record. So um, with that, I will go through the submissions that are um, recommended for the board to approve. So the first is submission number 30, and that is for mixed use tier one. Um, 
Next is submission number 336, again, a mixed use tier one. Submission number 173, mixed use tier one. Submission number 369 for mixed use tier one. Submission number 251 for mixed use tier one. Submission number 170 for mixed use tier one. Submission number 256, tier one mixed use. Submission number 565, tier one mixed use. Submission number 158 for tier one mixed use. Submission number 114 for outdoor tier one. Submission 81 for outdoor tier one. Submission 227 for outdoor tier one. And that is all we have for today. So we've got nine mixed use cultivators, six outdoor cultivators and two indoor for approval today. All right. So is there a motion to approve um, these? Yep, for qualification. I move that the board accept each of the recommendations for pre-qualification approval as presented to us by staff in this meeting. All right, is there a second? Second. second. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, great. All right. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Um, so I, I closed my agenda um, by accident. But I think all we have left is public comment. I think you're right. Let me just pull it up quickly. Double check. There's some lucky the street if we are wrong. Mm -hmm. no, I think that's right. Okay. Um, so we'll open up to public comment. Um, we'll do it the way that we traditionally have, which is um, folks that have joined via the link, raise your virtual hand. Um, then we'll move to people that join by the phone. And um, again, you know, if you ask us questions, we can't necessarily respond directly during public comment period. Um, we do collect questions and we try and update our FAQ document um, to reflect those questions that we receive. And, you know, you can always reach out to the board directly if you have a, a question. Um, but uh, for now, we'll open and it looks like start with Dave Silverman. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, two quick things. One is um, you mentioned uh, the waivers. Uh, on my list of waive provisions, I do see 1.4.4a uh, as being waived for tier one cultivators, and I just wanted to uh, see whether that's worth clarifying. Um, and um, I, I wanted to uh, just briefly raise a, a potential issue that I saw in um, the Senate Judiciary uh, Amendment. Um, I know you've been struggling with the FBI background check stuff, uh, and I imagine that the uh, language there is related to that and trying to get it to be more conforming to the FBI requirements. Um, but I think what, what I see there is now uh, every uh, shareholder in an LLC uh, is going to be deemed a principal, um, even if they're a very small, silent, non-controlling shareholder. Um, and that would require them to get fingerprinted because every shareholder in an LLC is, is called a member. And, and that's what the language now says in that Senate proposal. Um, if we're going to be going down a path of using a third party provider, and you're going to require every LLC shareholder to be fingerprinted. I just uh, I worry that that might get pretty expensive um, and um, kind of unnecessary uh, since the the statute doesn't otherwise really require you to do that full background check on every shareholder, really only on on shareholders who control and and people who have a significant managerial. Uh, role in the company. So um, just kind of laying that out for you as, a, as an area of potential concern. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. And yeah, you're right about 1.4.4a. Um, that is waived for tier one cultivators. Um, anyone else uh, that would like to make a public comment that joined by the link, the video link, uh, just raise your virtual hand. 
And if you join via phone um, and like to make a public comment, you can hit star six to unmute yourself. We have Jason Gulasano. Hey, good afternoon. Um, thanks for today's meeting. It, uh, it's a pretty informative, even though I missed half of it and I got lost online. I just had one question about maybe an example of a contingency plan for a tier one or a tier one manufacturer. Um, as far as a contingency plan, if it's a quick shutdown or in a unfortunate um, circumstances, you have to close down. That was just one thing when filling out the application would maybe be helpful. And um, as far as really agreeing with tier one manufacturing being such a small operation, it probably would make sense. And I appreciate you guys speaking about all these things um, online and have a good day. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. So again, just uh, feel free to raise your virtual hand or hit star six to unmute yourself. Ben Fisher is next. Hey, thanks uh, everybody for everything as always. Um, I am just uh, a little curious as to the prioritization of these uh, pre-qualification applications. Um, it's, I understand that tier one and small cultivators have a priority, but does that mean that a, say a tier two or three cultivator that has a finished application uh, before somebody else on a tier one, um, are tier one applications that have been submitted after um, larger tier applications, are they being prioritized? Um, I understand if it's the application submitted on the same day, but um, I'm not 100% sure it seems fair to the uh, higher tier applicants that they'll just keep getting pushed back in line every time a uh, smaller tier uh, puts in an application. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Any other public comments, either from folks on the phone or folks that join via the link? Okay. Um, I'll close the public comment window then. And um, you know, just, um, I think the contingency hello? plan, hello? Hello, yeah, sorry, I didn't. I pushed the wrong button. I missed just before you closed off. Uh, thanks again. Uh, here's my question. It's a question, not really a comment. What is the escrow amount required as an insurance alternative for tier one cultivator? Okay. Thanks for the comment. Um, I think you can find that in 2.2.2. .2 .2. Okay. Read the rules. It's... Thank you. Yep. No problem. All right. Um, any last public comments before we close? All right. Well, th thank you for the kind of questions and comments today. Um, we will kind of, we do take them into account. I can just say very briefly that the contingency plan, what we're really looking for is how you are, are you going to deal with kind of securing your inventory, securing, um, you know, any sort of cannabis or, any, you know, anything that you need that, you, you know, anything that we need as a board to make sure that that product doesn't end up on the illicit market that you can wind down your company in a um, in a way that uh, ensures kind of just general compliance with the federal government and, um, and just uh, public health and public safety here in Vermont. So um, that's that's the kind of purpose of a cessation plan. Um, other than that, um, I don't see anything else on our agenda. Julie or Kyle or Brent or David, is there anything else you want to raise before we adjourn? No, I'm good. All right. 
Um, well, then I will adjourn this meeting. Um, we'll be back next week um, on Monday. Um, really appreciate everyone um, joining today and for kind of bearing with us. And uh, we'll see you all next week.